Hello and welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark D. Baldwin and today I'd like to discuss briefly T.S. Eliot, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and then read it to you. T.S. Eliot created a new form of verse, a very poised measure that consisted usually of lines of varying length, commonly with four strong beats, and often pausing midway as if for deliberation very oral, uh, lends itself well to a dramatic reading, which I'm about to do for you. He wanted his poetry to be more subtle, suggestive, and precise than prior poets. And he rejected the romantic softness, he felt, romanticism was soft, he felt, because it called more attention to the poet's personality than to the poetic medium. This is a very self-aware sort of poetry, almost meta-poetry, if you will. Eliot once said that the most interesting verse is that which constantly approaches a fixed pattern without quite settling into it. He said, it is this contrast between fixity and flux, this unperceived evasion of monotony, which is the very life of verse. One of Eliot's real novelties is that in his poetry there's very few connective or transitional passages or phrases. He builds up the total pattern of meaning through an immediate juxtaposition of images without any overt explanation of what they are doing. A lot of oblique allusions and the dissociation of sensibility, the separation of thought from feeling, attempting to achieve an extinction of the poet's personality. As he said, the emotion of art is impersonal. Now, I know that's a very paradoxical notion, but think about it and see how it applies to Eliot. And one more aspect of Eliot worth mentioning is his theory of the objective correlative. He attempted to find the exact replication of an emotion through an objective image. His idea was that if you evoke the desired emotion in the reader through the forcing of that image, you'll create a collaborative effect and that will suggest different meanings for different readers. In other words, you don't tell people, oh, I was afraid. You show people an image, a scene, that will evoke that emotion. It's the old show, don't tell adage for writing. Okay, I'm about to start reading the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and you'll see uh, on each slide that corresponds to the lines that I'll be reading, uh, several notes and questions and things to consider. I don't want to interrupt the reading to discuss them. I'd like you to think about these aspects, and we can discuss them later on the discussion board. Thank you. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate, and time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. 
In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there's time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated frame. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I've known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare. But in the lamp light down with light brown air. Is it Perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I've gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. <laughs> I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis, but though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all, if one settling a pillow by her head should say, That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile? After the sunsets and the dooryard and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more, it is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern through the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, 
no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us, and we drown. Okay, that's a wrap. Uh, poor Proofrock has some issues, doesn't he? Maybe he needs to get down to Ebor or something. Huh? That's a little local illusion for those of you not familiar. Um, he's been in some rooms where women have been coming and going, but they are talking behind his back, so he thinks, and he doesn't know what to say to them. And he's in fear of being rejected. That's just a couple little hints there as the way that uh, I would read it, one way of reading it anyway. But don't let me influence you too strongly. Since it's great poetry, there's any number of uh, levels and symbolisms that you can delve into and read into it what you think is there and uh, enhance your interpretation and try to buttress it and widen it and enlighten it with uh, some research. So think about it. Read through it again. It's certainly one of literature's greatest poems. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next time.